So today, we're going to return back to uh, Job chapter 33. That's where we left off last week, so if you want to turn your Bibles there. Job chapter 33. I turned the microphone off behind me, so maybe that'll help with some of the feedback we were getting. All right, Job chapter 33, and if you remember on the lesson plan here where we're at, we're going to try to... uh, finish up lesson 12 today and then get into lesson 13. So we're talking about Elihu and Elihu's speeches right now. And then after that, we see where God starts speaking to, to Job. And that's going to be interesting, I'm sure, for us. So, so these are the next set of lessons here, including today, I think, are really good to help us understand kind of the intent of why Job was suffering. Um, so in, in chapter, was it chapter 32 and 33, we're introduced to Elihu, and Elihu is going to speak to Job. We talked about how he's, uh, at least there's a difference of opinion on what his purpose there for. Is it to repeat accusations against Job, or is he actually trying to bring some godly wisdom to Job? And I think based on the way that he speaks and based on the way that Job reacts and that Job doesn't answer him like he did his friends, I think it's, it's more that there's godly wisdom contained in there. So um, that's kind of the the stance that we're going to take from that as we go through his uh, discussion. But we definitely want to examine what he says and see if it it makes sense, right? If it does seem scriptural. Um, So, uh, yeah. So Elihu, what was his main point when he began speaking? How is he different than Job's three friends? He's younger, okay. He was a little angry, right? Yeah, he was definitely angry. He was angry that Job didn't give the right answers he thought, and he was angry at his friends for not having an answer for Job. Anybody else? What was different about Elihu's accusations against Job versus what, how his friends accused him? More angry at the other three? Okay. They weren't showing wisdom. That's that's true, Angie. More focused on God. More focused on God. Yeah. But what was he? What was uh, Job's three friends? What was their basis for accusing Job? Yeah. Well, where did they get that from? Why do they think that he had sinned? Because he'd been punished. I mean, they had no evidence of anything other than he was punished, right? And because he was punished so severely, he was suffering so severely, therefore, it must mean that you're evil. It must mean that you're a sinner. That was their basic, uh, basic uh, accusation against Job. How was Elihu different? Did he accuse Job of being a sinner? At least not directly, right? How did he accuse Job instead? What's the difference? Sorry? Everybody's a sinner. But specifically, Elihu tells Job, I'm going to answer you not based on what your friends are accusing you of, but I'm going to answer you based on your own words. I've sat here and listened to you speak. I've heard you say all these things. Based on what you've said alone... I'm going to have, I have a quarrel with, right? I have a quarrel with what you said, not what I think you've done. And that's his, his difference, is that as he's talking to Job, um, he looks at what Job has said. He doesn't look at the life of Job and say, well, you must have sinned because you're suffering. Instead, he looks at Job's words, and he repeats Job's words several times here in this passage in, in chapter 33. Job, this is what you said. This is why I think you're wrong. Job, this is what you said. This is why it seems wrong. So he's going back to the actual Job's words, and I think that's a huge difference between Elihu and his friends, and Job's friends. Yes, sir. Right. And that's why at the end it said, all had been said, Job's words had ended, and his friends, he was righteous in his own eyes, we're not going to talk to him anymore, so they all give it up. The Job's friends had given up on talking with Job, and Job had basically given up on talking to them because it was just circular arguments. But Elihu was different. He's going to talk about what Job actually says. Um, and uh, what, let's see, what was his, 
accusation for against Job in verses, let's see, 12 and 13 of, of chapter 33. Behold, in this you are not right. I will answer you, for God is greater than man. Why do you contend against him, saying, he will answer none of man's words? That's one of the things that Job said, is that uh, God would have no answer for his words, because again, Job viewed himself as being righteous. And that's pretty arrogant of Job, at least in Elihu's view. And I think that's, that's truthful. Why would you think that God wouldn't have an answer for you? If you have a problem with what you think God has done and you have a problem with God, why would you think God could not answer you? Um, and we're going to see that again in chapter 40, verse 2. God will say, will say the same thing to Job. Uh, who are we to say that God must answer us? So Elihu's message is this. God does speak, and he speaks through suffering. And that's the, the last part of this chapter I wanted to really talk about today because we didn't really cover it last week, and it's kind of important. Um, that's kind of Elihu's main theme here is, Job, yeah, you're suffering, but God is speaking to you through this suffering. So if we go back to chapter 33, verses 14 through 18. For God speaks in one way and in two, though man does not perceive it. In a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, while they slumber on their beds, then he opens the ears of men and terrifies them with warnings, that he may turn man aside from his deed and conceal pride from a man. He keeps back his soul from the pit, his life from perishing by the sword. Okay? What does that say? What is that telling us? What is Elihu's message there? God makes man repent. Yeah, the, the, he sees the purpose of suffering as a way to correct us, right? To prevent what from happening. Yeah, being lost. Verse 18, to keep his soul from the pit. It says, if, you don't, if you're not going to experience suffering, if you're not going to uh, be corrected by God, then you're going to fall into the pit. You're going to perish by the sword. That's, that's, your, that's your end. So if God cared about you, he's going to allow suffering to happen because he's going to, he wants to keep you from the pit. Uh, remember again, in patriarchal period, God would speak directly to, to people. Uh, he would speak through visions and dreams uh, during the patriarchal and mosaic times. And you remember Joseph and Nebuchadnezzar, prophets, that, that theme uh, continues on. So that's what's being talked about here at the beginning in verse 15 about dreams and visions. That's how God spoke to people. Um, but God speaks another way, and Job needs to listen to it, and that's through suffering. Uh, the friends have said that suffering is a consequence from sin, but Elihu says that God can also use suffering for a purpose, and that, would, again, is verses 17 through 18, that he may turn aside from his deed and conceal pride from man. Realize you're wrong, change your ways, change from it, and not be prideful, as to keep his soul from the pit and his life from perishing by the sword. And that's where Elihu sees the, uh, a, re a reason for suffering. God, through his words and through his actions, keep humans from the worst possible fate. And Elihu says that if we did not have suffering, we would fall into the pit. And if you continue to read on through chapter 33, we read last week, he brings up this idea of the pit again a few, a few times. Um, God does not allow suffering because we are his enemies. And that's what Job's accusation was. God, why am I your enemy? Why are, you, why are you dead set against me? Why are you crushing me? Why are you opposed to me? You keep seeing those words that, that Job is saying. Job seems to think, like, my relationship with God is messed up, and for some reason God has set himself against me. And that's how he was viewing it. But that's not what Elihu is saying that view is wrong. God does not allow suffering because we are his enemies, like Job asserts. God uses suffering instructively. Um, the discipline of God is his grace to save us. So when we get discipline from God, that's part of his grace and his desire that we turn from our ways, that we, that we, be, that we be saved, that we repent from sin. Um, and now verses 23 through 30, the point Elihu makes here is that uh, God is merciful and delivering people from going into this pit using messengers and mediators. So again, different people. Uh, let's see, verse 28, uh, 28. He, ha he has redeemed my soul from going down into the pit, and my life shall look upon the light. Behold, God does all these things twice, three times with a man, to bring back his soul from the pit, that he may be lighted with the light of life. 
So again, he, this is why Elihu thinks suffering happens. Um, God uses suffering to direct our steps, not to destroy us. Anybody have any comments about that or thoughts about that? Right, exactly. Same, same, same concept. Anybody else? Oh, sorry. Thought I saw him. Um, I saw a, a quote from C.S. Lewis that seemed interesting. It was, God whispers to us in our pleasures, speaks in our conscience, but shouts in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And I think that's a, a fitting way to think about it. Right? When we're doing good and we're happy and everything's going great in our lives, hopefully we're thinking about God, right? Hopefully we're thanking him for that great things that are happening to us. But it's usually it's kind of a whisper, right? It's not something that's really forefront in our minds. Maybe a lot more than it should be. Um, when something we see is wrong and it affects our conscience, right? Then, then that's God speaking to us in a way. If our heart is really set on God, and we're following God, and God is in our heart, then our conscience is going to be pricked when we see something that's wrong, and it's going to be a way of God speaking to us. But when we're suffering in pain, that's when we tend to grow, grow closer to God, right? That's when it's like, I don't know why I'm suffering, but I want God to fix it for me, right? I want God to be there to help me. So that usually brings us closer to God. Yep, I think we're going to talk about that some more in today's lesson, but that's exactly one of the points. We, we mentioned before that suffering happens, and when we suffer, we're not necessarily going to know the reason why, right? That's what we talked about a few weeks ago. Mm -hmm. it's, not, it's, it's certainly not just God trying to destroy us or trying to correct us necessarily, right? There could be suffering happening in our lives, even though we're in the right in a certain sense. But I think the nuance that I want to, we're going to talk about more as we go through today's lesson is we still want to use those opportunities to grow closer to God. We still want to, we still want to thank God for that suffering, right? Yeah. And we're, we're going to, we're going to touch on that, but that's an important point. It doesn't mean necessarily, oh, I'm suffering. Therefore, God's telling me that this one thing I did is wrong and I need to fix it. It could be that I'm suffering, and if I'm, if I'm talking to God about it and I'm working it out with God, then everything is great in my life, right? Because I still have God in my life. But if I'm not paying attention to God and I'm suffering and I'm being beaten down by it, that's, that's a problem, right, in my life because I need to get closer to God because that's the only way I'm going to get through that kind of suffering. So it's all in how we react to the suffering. Yeah. Right. Yeah, time and chance happen to all, and that's certainly true. Um, this idea that, that C.S. Lewis had about, about speaking to us or shouting to us in pain, there's a passage in Proverbs chapter 3. Turn real quick. Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 11. Proverbs 3 verses 11 and 12. Uh, wait, that's not it. Sorry, I'm in the wrong passage. Proverbs 3, 11 and 12. Uh, my son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be wary of his reproof. For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. So again, if we're doing things wrong and God loves us, he's going to chasten us for that. And again, that doesn't necessarily mean that because we're suffering, we've done something wrong. But if we are suffering, it, it could be a way of, of God chastening us. Also in Hebrews chapter 12, verses 5 through 11. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 5. Uh, and have you forgotten the exhortation that addresses you as sons? My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. It is the discipline that you have to endure. God is entreating you as sons. For what son is there whom his father does not discipline? If you are left without discipline in which all have participated, then you are illegitimate children and not sons. Besides this, we have earthly fathers who discipline us, 
and we respected them. Shall we not much more be subject to the Father of spirits and, and live? Uh, verse 10, for they disciplined us for a short time as it seems best to them, but he disciplines us for our good that we may share his holiness. For the moment, all discipline seems painful rather than pleasant, but later it yields the peaceful fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. Okay. Yes. Yeah, Job's, Job's attitude is, is, again, that somehow God is his enemy, that something has happened that has broken his relationship with God, and that God is not necessarily out to get him, but at least not aware of his righteousness. And that's, that's the, the struggle he's trying to face. And Elihu's going to address that as we continue on here. And it's very important back to the, the point that we were talking about before about the reason for suffering. Uh, too often, like the passages we just read, the one in Hebrews here, we read this passage as being, you being punished for your sins... But it's not the point of the authors. Thank you, sir. Um, Rather, God allows this discipline and instruction through suffering for your own good to make us what God desires. This is why so many authors say that we can rejoice in our sufferings because instruction of God is found in them. And again, the point is, if we're suffering, God is instructing us. We're going to get instruction from that suffering. So whether we accept that instruction or not is a a different question. And even if we're suffering and it's not for a sin that we've committed, there's still instruction from God in that suffering. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 3 through 5. Not only that, but we rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who, who has been given to us. Again, there is benefit in our suffering. Uh, James chapter 1, verses 2 through 4. Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness. And let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So again, the idea here of of suffering being a benefit to us. And the picture I wanted to to take here is, have you ever seen, um, you know, a hot pan on a stove that's that's really hot and it's, you you know it's hot? Have you ever grabbed something that's hot and had it burn your hand, right? Is God punishing you for grabbing that hot pan? (laughs) Is that punishment from God? I'm suffering, right? So therefore, I'm suffering. That must be God's way of punishing me because I grabbed a hot pan. I think that's silly. We would all agree with that. Um, But what if we didn't feel the pain when we grabbed the hot pan? What would happen to us? Yeah, you'd burn your hand. You'd tear up your flesh. I mean, it would be really mangle your body, and you'd keep doing it because you wouldn't realize it, right? You see another pan, and you grab it, not thinking about it being hot or not. So what's the benefit of the pain? that we get when you grab a hot pan. <laughs> Teaches you not to do it again. And if I see a pan on the stove, I might think, hmm, I wonder if that's hot, right, before I grab it, right? I'm not just going to instinctively grab it. Um, that's a way that, that that pain is an instruction to us. Um, so you could say, or you could say, it is a grace from God that we feel pain when we grab a hot pan before we wind up melting our skin and causing permanent damage to our hand. That pain is a blessing. That suffering is a blessing. And this is kind of what Elihu is, is, is getting at here. Suffering is good for us because the pain is an instruction to us. Um, and it's an instruction that we, we're not going to forget. And it's one that's going to prevent us from falling into that pit and having that permanent, lasting harm to our soul. That's what he's saying is when you're suffering, there's instruction in it. And if you learn from that instruction, that's going to make you stronger. It's going to make you better. It's going to make you better able to avoid that pit and not fall in it again. Just as grabbing that hot pan and feeling that pain is going to teach you not to do it again. And we say the same thing to children, right? You know, children are always trying to do things that are bad. Sometimes it's good to let them have that pain for that one time and realize, oh, that's bad, and I'm not going to do that again. And that's some of how God is working with us. Suffering is purposeful from God's perspective, and it must be the perspective we adopt for our lives. And this is going to lead into today's lesson. God's not punishing you through your suffering, but he's teaching you. 
God has allowed suffering in this world and in our lives so that we treat it like a hot pan, teaching us to consider our ways and to keep our eyes focused on God. And again, back to, that's not just suffering because I've committed a sin and God is reprimanding me for it. Even if I'm just suffering, I can still use that as an opportunity to grow closer to God, to get God's instruction, to, to learn from God. Um, and the, the, the corollary to that is to think about it this way. If everything was perfect here on this earth, if life was heaven on earth, and we had heaven here on earth, how would that affect the way we act? How would that affect our relationship with God? If we experienced heaven and perfection on earth, we'd have no desire to be with God in eternity. Like, what, what, is this, what are you talking about, this eternity thing with God? I've got everything I want right here. Life is wonderful. I can't imagine anything better, right? This is heaven. It would definitely change how we view God. Um, we'd be perfectly content to stay here on earth, be selfish in our ways, but God's created a system that allows us to suffer so that we're tested and refined and instructed and made, made wiser. And again, the intent of that is to not lose our souls, but instead to grow closer to God. God allows suffering for teaching. We must be willing to listen to what God says through our suffering so that we are drawn closer to him. All right, that's, that's the point I wanted to hit from chapter 33 that we didn't get to last week. Because I thought it was important. Because it directly relates to what we've been talking about all along about Job and Job's suffering. And how Job is treating his suffering. Anybody else have any comments you want to make on that? Before we move on to 34. Zach. Yeah, I'm not sure he's totally wrong in how he's applying it. That's, that's where I think I differ. I think my view of Elihu has kind of changed as I've been going through this. Um, he's certainly applying it to Job, who's described as a righteous person. Absolutely. But we're going to see uh, later on, I'm trying to find where, if it's chapter 34 or 35. He makes the point to Job that, Job, you're, you're saying things about God that are wrong, right? You're saying that God must be your enemy because you're suffering. You're saying that God would have no answer for you, right? That God can't, God can't, uh, can't answer your question about why you would be suffering, right? You're making all these accusations about God through your words that don't seem right. Therefore, maybe you do need more suffering, right? Maybe your suffering is you need more instruction from God. And that's the point that he kind of makes. And Job doesn't answer him. That's kind of the, the problem, right? If Job had come up with this robust defense about why Elihu's wrong, then you could have a good point. But it's the fact that Job can't even answer that question. It's like, yeah, I... I, I'm, at least in my mind, that's the, that's, the, that's the take I get from it, is that there's, there's accuracy in Elihu's accusation against him here. Um, i got to find that pattern. We're going to get to it today, I think. If not, it's, it'll be, well, yeah, it'll have to be today. Because it's in this part. Yeah, absolutely. And you got to think, he's been going through this for probably months. I mean, this is going to be draining on him, right? Absolutely. And no, no, no qualm about that. Job has certainly been through way more than we could imagine. Um, okay, so let's get to chapter 34, and hopefully I can find that passage I'm talking about. Uh, Job chapter 34, let's read verses 1 through 9 quickly. Then Elihu answered and said, Hear my words, you wise men, and give ear to me, you who know, for the ear tests words as the palate tastes food. Let us choose what is right. Let us know among ourselves what is good. For God has said, I am in the right, and God has taken away my right. In the spirit of my right, I am counted a liar. My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. What man is like Job, who drinks up scoffing like water, who travels in company with evildoers and walks with wicked men? 
For he has said, it profits a man nothing that he should take delight in God. So again here in this uh, introduction here for chapter 34, Elihu again declares uh, to Job that Elihu's contention is with what Job said. And again, this is different from what his free friends. Job, this is what you said, and this is what I have a problem with. It's not a made-up thing about, well, I assume you've done this, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have an issue with that. Um, Elihu does not say that Job sinned in his actions, and then that is why he's suffering, like his friends said. Elihu instead challenges Job because of what Job said. Uh, he calls for the wise men to listen to what he's about to say. And again, that's probably a reference to Job's three friends there, right? Because um, they have claimed that they have wisdom. But in verses 5 and 6, he quotes Job. He says, For Job has said, I am in the right, and God has taken away my right. In my spite of my right, I am counted a liar. My wound is incurable, though I am without transgression. So again, Job, you've said that God's taken something away from you, um, that, that God's said that you're a liar and that there's no way to fix it, right? That God can't fix it for you or no, no one can fix it for you, even though you are righteous and without transgression. And that's, that's a pretty accurate view of what Job has said. Job has said that he's in the right and, and God has not been just toward him. We have seen Job challenge the justice of God because he looks at his own life and cannot understand why he's suffering. And again, we've talked about that in the last several weeks through, as he's been responding to his, to his three friends. Um, God, must not, uh, be, God must not be just is the conclusion Job has, or at least God is allowing injustice to happen is what Job's view is. Uh, even more, Elihu quotes Job again in verse 9, saying, It profits a man nothing that he should take delight in God. Job has said there's no purpose in serving God because you're going to suffer whether you're righteous or whether you're wicked. Zach? I don't know that he's taking him out of context. <laughs> no, that's fair. Uh, certainly fair. But um, it seemed like there was another place. I'd have to go look again. Job, I mean, he, in this case, it does seem a bit out of context. But Job's ultimate accusation, again, is that God is allowing this unrighteousness to happen, right? Because if God was really righteous, then why would, why would Job be suffering? He makes that point as well. So I think there's still some, some truth to what's being said. Yeah. Okay. Mm-hmm. Well, I th- but I, again, I, we can, so I guess it's a, it's, a, it's a matter of how you read Elihu, right? So if you read him like Zach does, then yeah, I, I think he's saying you're taking him out of context and you're making a false accusation against Job. The point is what Job said, those words, is what the wicked, wicked would say. Now, maybe you say Job doesn't mean it that way because Job is being taken out of context. And Elihu is assuming he really meant it or that he's... he's uh, he has that attitude. But in any case, those words, that idea, that concept that God can't answer you, that God can't be just or is not just, that's what wicked people say. So I guess it's in how you read Elihu. Um, anybody else want to pitch in on that one? Go for it. I lost my place in my notes here. Sorry, I guess right.
God's justice and the other is his law of righteousness. Yeah. And so Job knows he's righteous and then he knows the law of recompense and so he assumes that the third must be wrong. Whereas Job's friends, they accept the law of recompense and mm-hmm. accept God's justice, therefore Job must be wrong. Yeah. Yeah. Calling God unjust. Elihu's coming in and saying, you need to stop because God is absolutely just. And we'll see throughout the next yeah, yeah. section mm-hmm. that Elihu is really focusing on God's majesty, right. his righteousness, and his justice. And that's really what he's doing. Yeah. He, again, Elihu's contention is with the words that Job said about God not being just. Now, we can discuss whether he's taken out of context or not. Like, that's perfectly fine to do, right? But the concept or the idea that God is not just is definitely something that Elihu has a problem with, and he disagrees wholeheartedly, and I think rightly so. Um, he's definitely attributing that, that attitude to Job, if not directly, at least indirectly. And again, we could say he's taking Job out of context. That seems fair, but uh, that's what he has a problem with. Um, Job has said, there's no purpose serving God because you're going to suffer whether you're righteous or wicked. Well, the idea of you know, why bother serving God? Because you're just going to suffer. Everybody suffers on the earth. And we can agree with that, right? Everybody on earth suffers. We see suffering all the time. Everybody suffers. Um, does that mean that there's no purpose serving God? Because whether we serve him or not, we're still going to suffer. This is what Elihu takes issue with. Um, verses 7 through 8 in chapter 34. What man is like Job, who drinks up scoffing like water, who travels in company with evildoers and walks with wicked men? Um, Elihu is saying that you speak and act like the wicked when you say these things. And again, maybe he's taking Job out of context, but um, that's that's his attitude. Uh, Verse 36, uh, he says again, Job answers like wicked men. The The words Elihu quotes Job saying are important here. Um, the initial challenge in the book, right? What was the accusation that Satan made against Job? Yeah, he only serves because you protect him. He only serves because you do good things for him, right? Look at all these great benefits you're giving to Job. Of course he's going to serve you. You took those away from him, he's going to curse you. That, that was Satan's main accusation. People only serve God for the blessings they get. That's what Satan challenged. If you didn't bless people, nobody would serve you. That was Satan's accusation. Uh, Job has said that there, so in this idea or the concept that there's no profit in serving God, um, Elihu is saying that's wrong. Um, It's wrong to accuse God of not rewarding those who are obedient to him. And that's what he's going to talk about now in the remainder of this chapter, verses 10 through 37. And I don't think we really have time to read that today, so we're going to continue on. Hopefully you've already had a chance to read it before. Uh, First, Elihu asserts that God is just. God cannot do wickedness and cannot do wrong. And that's verses 10 through 12. Chapter 34, verses 10 through 12. Uh, God is just without exception. He does not pervert justice. He does not do wrong. Verses 13 through 15. God is sovereign and answers to no one. Again, idea. God does not owe us an answer. God does not answer to us. We're not in a position to tell God what is just and what is not just. And again, this is, I think, is an accurate criticism of Job. Job is saying, I'm suffering such cruelty, but I'm righteous. It doesn't make sense, so God must not be aware of my righteousness, or he's allowing the suffering to happen despite my righteousness. Therefore, there's uh, some discrepancy. God, this is what is just. Why are you not doing this? Like, Why are you letting me suffer? That's, that's the, the idea from Job. And I think that's one thing that Elihu was angry about. And I think that's a, that's a fair criticism of Job. Uh, versus, well, the idea that whether or not we can tell God what is just or not. If we go back to, like, who is God? How would you describe God? Justice and righteousness is part of his character. So how could we say that God is not acting in keeping with his own character? Mm-hmm. If I tell you to go rob a bank and you rob a bank, I'm still culpable for that, right? I mean, I'm. 
Are you? Well, I mean, I can, I can walk down the street and tell someone to go rob a bank and then walk on. And if that person goes and robs the bank, I'm not responsible for that. No, I, I understand your point. And, it, and that's the whole purpose of our whole discussion on Job. But I read this, I don't know We're not done yet, though. We've got, we've got three more lessons. <laughs> yeah. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Where, where would we be today? Again, we talked about this before. Where would we be today without this record in Job of seeing what Job went through, right? How would we treat suffering in our lives if we didn't see this example from Job? And again, back to your, your, your point about God didn't necessarily, God didn't go attack Job. Again, this is, this, is, this is the accusation that Job is kind of implying. God, why are you letting this stuff happen to me? Why are you my enemy, God? God, why are, why are we foes? I liked you a lot better when we were friends. I don't like being your enemy. And he's got this concept of God being his enemy. But God's not attacking Job. It's true that God, it's true that God allowed Satan to have power over Job, right? So isn't that still God's So God takes responsibility. God says, say in verse in Second chapter two, where He says, "You made me destroy Job, even though He'd done nothing wrong." Right? So He He accepts that He's responsible. He accepts He's responsible, but He didn't. It's different from Him doing it to Job, right? It's different from Him being Job's enemy. And this is back to, what's the purpose of Job serving? This is the whole question, right? This is the root question. Do we serve God for nothing? Why, why Job, do you serve God? Is it because God's so great to you? And that's what we as humans, that's the, that's the connection we want to draw. Because somebody does good for me, I'm going to help them out and do good for them. And it's the whole purpose of contrasting. God is not that way. That view of the world that, that, that we have, that we all have in the back of our minds, is it puts God in such a small, tiny box. It says, God, you know, you function this way, and I know exactly how you function. And the whole point about Job has been chapter after chapter blowing us up, saying the way you think God works, the way you think God runs the world is just wrong. You're trying to put God in all these different constraints and scenarios and situations like, well, this guy, he did some nice thing to this guy, so why didn't he get blessed when this other guy may have done something? We're trying to build this scenario, and it's like, that's just such a small view of who God is. And the whole point is God is way greater than all that. And that's what Elihu's going to get to in the next chapter. Is here's all about God's majesty. And that's what God's going to talk about when he comes in. Who are you to challenge, you know, who I am? Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, absolutely. And that was the whole point about talking about instruction, right? Suffering doesn't mean bad. That's very important. Right. God is not concerned with our pleasure and happiness in this life. That's not his ultimate goal. I think he wants that. I think he's yeah. heard that. But that's not his ultimate goal. His goal is for us to be the humans that he pulls us to be, to get to heaven, to be with him. And so if suffering, part of suffering helps us to get there, or he helps other people to get there. Exactly. And again, back to all of the suffering Job endured. How horrible would that be? I mean, it's hard to even wrap your head around how much he suffered. Think about all the people in the world that have learned from Job's suffering. Where would all those people be today without the record of Job's suffering? So even though Job suffered immensely, the amount of good that it did to bring people closer to God, you know, even generation after generation, is just overwhelming. We can't even begin to fathom. And the whole point, again, about why would a righteous God allow this to happen, right? Why Job, God, if you're righteous, why would you allow me to be destroyed and to die and to suffer? And the whole point that Elihu is going to get to again is God works on his own timetable. His righteousness, his justice will be fulfilled. It's not that it's not going to happen. It's not that righteousness is going to be avoided. 
God is righteous by nature, and it has to happen. And that's the whole idea of why we talk about judgment and why we talk about, you know, what, what Jesus had to go through. And that whole purpose is to fulfill God's righteousness to, so, so that righteousness can be accomplished. But we, we as humans, we're really stuck on our little window of time, right? We're like, well, I want righteousness right now. And like, I want this guy that did something bad to me to get his righteousness right now, right? And, it's, and we lose sight of our own unrighteousness in that same process, right? But it's, yeah. Yeah. I think you're right. That would be a huge thing to get through. I, I completely agree with you. But that's the whole point, right? If we don't ever learn that lesson from Job, we're not going to grow as Christians, right? We're that first little thing that comes along that says in our minds, like, I don't know that that was right. That, that, that didn't seem fair that that happened to me. That's going to destroy us because my idea is. I serve God and he does great things for me. And now, now that's been blown apart. And that's what the whole purpose of Job is. Get rid of that now because that's not true. Brian? I think of just between our children. Yeah. And I look back on the verse we read in Hebrews. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 11, uh, 12, 11. Um, all this one for the moment seems not to be royal. Exactly. Yeah. But now I look back at their wisdom and the boundaries they set for me because of that discipline. I'm yeah. more, not more, I hate to say righteous, but you're good guy. Yeah, I'm more disciplined. Well, I, I look at the family I grew up in. How would my life have been different had my parents not said, if you cross this line, you're, you know, you're going to get it, right? I, I may have crossed that line, and it would definitely change the outlook on my life. Amy? Exactly. But the end result is that they will prove that all this suffering happening to you is going to prove that you'll be able to make it strong. Yeah. Break down the other people. Yeah, absolutely. Good point. Was there another hand? Angie? I was just going to say, I mean, to me, I think it's the five, eight, and nine. Mm. Where it says, for well, my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways, my ways, says the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my thoughts. Yeah. To me, it's as simple as that. That it's so hard to look and try to put this in our little worldly wisdom. It doesn't fit. Yeah. It's not going to fit. We just have to allow it not to fit. And so exactly. God, I trust you. And, and that, that's what always gets me when we talk about, the, about Jesus on the cross, right? Like my, my idea of righteousness does not include that. And if I could change anything, my first thought would be well, I don't think Jesus should have to go through what he went through. That doesn't seem fair. That doesn't seem like a just God would do that. But yet, if you really think about what it allowed to happen, that was the, that was the most righteous way for God to act because he saved all of us, right? We would have no hope if it weren't for him. How would a just God let us all be perished? But instead, he gave us this pathway to salvation. And, like, and the, it, it's all back to that root point about suffering is bad. And it's like, we got we to gotta break that because that's not the way the world operates with God in control. There. Yeah. And I think that's a key point here because if we don't understand the purpose of all of this, God yeah. does. Absolutely. And I've often wondered if you go back to the beginning of this book and the context is faith in God. Yeah. And everything else is from that. So was God giving Satan an opportunity to repent? Giving him an example in Job? Yeah. That's an interesting thought, but yeah. And that's why I titled the lesson today, Your God is Too Small. That was the point. If you view God in this way, that God must operate this because this happens, this, ha this must be God's reaction, it's putting God in such a small, limited capacity. And we know that that's not who God is. And back to what Elihu's going to talk about, again, is God's majesty and how wrong that idea is because God is way bigger than that. He's way greater than that. Okay, well, we are way out of time. So... We'll take another stab at Lesson 13 next week. Um, we're just getting started on that.
please uh, read the rest of Elihu's speech and try to get to chapter 38 where God starts to, to talk to Job because that's, we'll see if we can get that far next week. But I really love the comments. They were very great today. Thank you very much.